Hello again, and welcome. Michael Pizzoli here. I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the Value Capping Rant. This is the 2022 Belmont Stakes Edition. And I'd like to take you through what we're going to go over um, in this video, give you a quick look at my approach, which is value capping, uh, why I do what I do, and we'll take an in-depth look at the Belmont. So in value capping the 2022 Belmont Stakes, um, I'm going to give you a little, in, uh, a little insight into the historical pace and position. What does that mean? We're going to look at the Belmonts going back to 2012, I think, and looking at where they, where the winners were at the second call and how they distributed their energy. We'll also look at the projection of the pace in the 2022 Belmont, and there's a there's a bit of an anomaly in this race, which I'll point out to you and we'll look at some different scenarios. And of course, we'll take an in-depth look at the runners with that in mind. In other words, what kind of uh, runner, um, thank you, Todd, by the way, who wrote me and said that I should call all of these fillies and colts and hims and hers runners. So we'll take an in-depth look at the runners and see how they fit into the historical uh, track profile of the mile and a half at Belmont and also how they fit in with the projection of the race. Most importantly, we'll take a look at the odds lines in the race and see if there is a value bet or not. Now, for those of you who are not interested in all that, what one fan kindly said, mumbo jumbo, or I think he compared me to Professor Erwin Corey, for those, those of you old enough to remember him, um, here you go. I mean, it's no surprise. We the people and Mo Donegal are on the top of the value capping um, the value capper software line. Their morning lines are two to one and five to two. Ah, big surprise, Michael Pizzola. What a genius you are. Um, there may be some prices. This is right out of the box on an early bias. Um, we'll get into why that is. Um, possibly a long shot play on Golden Glider, although I have reservations about that, perhaps Nest. There's a lot to get into, but those of you only interested, who does value cap or pick? What does it look like? Here you go. And I wish you well. Good luck at the races. I'll see you later. Uh, that's, thank you for joining me for this long. And if you'll bear with me, those of you who do want to watch longer and uh, don't know who I am, my name is Michael Pizzola. I've been writing about, teaching, and coaching about this great game for over 30 years. I am the author of the best-selling handicapping book, Handicapping Magic, co-author of the classic Pace Makes the Race, I'm the creator of the original online racing form going back to 1994, if you can believe it, before there was this thing called the internet, or it was in its infancy. And you can find its current iteration at posttimedaily.com. I am the creator of the Value Capper software, the software I'll be using to um, take a look at the Belmont stakes. Um, but more importantly than the software or any numbers or any method are the principles of value capping. Um, I did a whole course on this. It's a free video course. And yes, the last video is like, hey, here's how you can get the super duper software, but forget that. If you don't want software, not interested in computers, the first two talk about the principles of value capping, which I'll go over with you a little bit. Um, in this video, you can get it at valuecapper.com. It's four videos, comes into your email once every couple of days, uh, deals with the value capping framework, the difference between value capping and handicapping. And if you don't do anything but watch those two videos, I think you'll find a, a way of thinking and looking at the game that may be different than the way you look at it now, and it may help. Okay, so why do I do this? Why do I do what I do? I like to think that I help horse players and handicappers and trainers and owners and breeders and all the rest um, succeed in the modern game by overcoming overwhelm and confusion and adopting a value-oriented approach, okay? And I do that so they can uh, increase their return on investment. Not number of winners, not, woohoo! I had that one. Uh, I'm, I think I'm unlike others in this 
space, as the kids like to say, don't know what that means, uh, who are concerned with predicting the outcome of a particular race. Rather, I teach players to find value bets, uh, overlays, betting if there's value, more importantly, passing if there isn't, and developing a stress-free investment strategy. Now, you haven't noticed I emphasize the modern game because back in the day, as we old-timers like to say, back in the 80s when I was, uh, I, I like to think, instrumental in developing some of the techniques of looking at incremental velocity and pace, uh, those of you remember from those old, uh, old days, and you could find enormous um, imbalances in pace that went off at good prices. Not so much anymore. The game has changed with, excuse me, with the internet and with the proliferation of pretty good numbers. It's hard to get a price on horses that look obvious. So what do we do? We look at more non-obvious horses. And that's what the value capping framework is about. We look for horses that we like. Yes, of course. We're not going to bet, you know, slow running plotters. But something, we look for them that have something about them that the public should not like. And preferably, that horse will be running against a vulnerable favorite. A favorite that may look good to the public, but has some kind of flaw, taking a negative drop in class, having a really hard last race, and so forth. Crucial to this is waiting for your price. After you do this for a while, you get a sense of the bet making you. And what I mean by that is a felt sense coming from practice. Okay, um, very quickly, this is not a touting video. If you want a touting video for someone to pick a horse for you so you can go bet them at the Belmont and cheer on, there are a few hundred on either side of this video probably or below it. I don't do that. I don't pick horses for others. I don't pick horses. I find value opportunities. I do this to demonstrate how to put this, what may sound theoretical to you, these these principles of value capping into, uh, uh, into practice on a particular race, in this case, the Belmont Stakes. I am making this video on Wednesday before the Belmont. Uh, I don't have scratches. I don't have weather changes. The long range forecasts, and we all know how those go, say there might be rain in Elmont, New York uh, on Saturday. Uh, will that change? Well, it depends how heavy the rain is and so forth. I don't have much evidence in my historical database on mile-and-a-half races being run at Belmont uh, in, in the slop. So I, you know, just hoping it's not too bad of a rainstorm if it comes. And look, software, any software, my software, the software I use, that is, um, your software, my numbers, other people's numbers, all of these are tools, they are not crystal balls. And if I can give you a bit of Dutch uncle advice, I spent decades of my life looking for that magic number that would predict the race, a crystal ball into the race. And then I'd find something and I was, whoa, this is great. All I have to do is find middle moves and turf races with a good late fraction and then I'll be okay. And I'll play the next race and maybe win that. And then the next race, and oh my God, the horse finished up the track. What's wrong? And then I would go and try to devise something that would get all three races and uh, eureka. And then the next race would come off and that didn't quite work. It was a never ending task. And I love this picture uh, representing the myth of Sisyphus, who was doomed to roll a boulder a rock, big rock, up a hill, only to have it come down the other side. What I like about this um, rendition, I, I sh really should give credit to the artist. I don't have her name uh, available, but Sisyphus is pushing up a ball of which the mountain is made. That all these ideas that we have of, you know, pace, trainers, jockeys, you know, all the, all the, the stuff that we do, looking for something that predicts with certainty. And in my years at this game, I haven't found anything that predicts with absolute certainty. Now, my software, my numbers, you know, point to well-meant and, and, and good-looking uh, horses, yeah. Does it fail miserably sometimes? Yeah, look at the Preakness last week. Look at 
the, the rich strike in the derby. Didn't uh, didn't care for uh, rich strike at all. Didn't care for early voting. But then again, there wasn't really a prime bet in the race, and I'm okay with that. In other words, uh, to get value, you've got to make some calls, and it did. And sometimes you make a call, and the horse doesn't run. Now, Epicenter and Zandon were obvious in the Derby, and they finished second and third. They got beaten by uh, Rich Strike. Um, okay. Um, in the Preakness, again, uh, not a. I didn't think it was a value opportunity. I did not, and by I, I mean my, my analysis along with the software, didn't really care for early voting. Okay, fine. So what do I do? Do I try to get early voting? No, because there wasn't any value in the race, so I don't really care. Okay, end of sermon, sorry. Uh, but the point of this is that potential value bets are price dependent. And if there's no adequate price, there's no bet. Okay. I'll give you an example. Last year's Belmont. Here's what Value Capper did with it. Okay. It put Essential Quality and Hot Rod Charlie on top with a gap over Known Agenda, Rock Your World, and Rombauer all tied at six, six to one on the Value Capper odds line. Oh, Michael, what a genius. Really? You liked Essential Quality and Hot Rod Charlie? Well, yeah, so did everyone else. They were, you know, first and third morning line favorites. Uh, Essential Quality, as you know, won the race. Hot Rod Charlie ran second. And Ron Bauer, known agenda, finished third and fourth. But look, what have, what have you done? Now, most people would be, you know, uh, you, you, you ever do a search on, uh, an internet search on, 2022 Belmont said, get tips and, and selections from the expert who picked the last two Belmont stakes or whatever. Yeah, I had them in order. I don't think that's a very, <laughs> a very great accomplishment. We agreed with the public. Value capping has to do with betting horses you like the public shouldn't. So morning line on essential quality and hot ride Charlie last year, uh, you know, and Ron Bauer, the three morning line favors finish one, two, three. Now, I don't say, you know, you have to go by that. But even known agenda, who is six to one on the value capper line, only went off at six to one. So my opinion, there's no price there. But let's leave out that it's a mile and a half race, a distance that's not really susceptible to the kind of incremental fractional velocity handicapping that I, I do and on which... Um, a lot of value capper is based. So, okay, remember, value bets are price dependent. There's no price, there's no bet. We have an advantage. It's not like blackjack or, uh, you know, you sit down for playing video poker or slot machine uh, or video poker and you press the button and you don't like the hand that you're given. Well, too bad, you're already bet. Same thing with blackjack. Let's leave surrender out of it. Oh my gosh, I got a, you know, terrible hand. Well, you, if you just throw the cards and you lose, you've anteed up, like poker, you've anteed up. So if you fold, that's fine, but you lose the ante. There's no ante in horse racing. No price, no bet. Just that simple. All right, let's take a closer look at the 2022 Belmont Stakes. Uh, here again is where I start. This is my canvas. Um, we the people, Moldonagal, Nest, Golden Glider. I've got an issue with Creative Minister, which I'll get to in a second. Let's look at the pace analysis and let's look at the recent Belmont stakes. And by recent, I mean going back to 2012. And we see something interesting. The beaten lengths at the second call, um, 0.6 in 2021. Uh, we're not going to talk about 2020 because the Belmont stakes is a mile and a half, period, end of story. 3.7 uh, in 19. Uh, 0, 2.1, 3.5, 0, and so forth. And notice something about the percentage of energy distribution. This is a measure of how uh, the horse expends its energy early compared to over the total amount of the race. The higher that number, the more it expends its energy early, the lower the number, the more late is the horse. So an early horse is 53%, uh, high 52s. A late horse, so you see this on the turf a lot, is 50% or, or below. And interestingly, if you look at the energy 
in the past Belmonts and mile and a half races run at Belmont. Um, 5093, let's skip down 499, 55. About the only one that sticks out is the 2013 Belmont, where it was 5284. Um, just an anomaly. I, I, I think that was an anomaly. I don't remember who won in 2013. I don't keep this stuff cluttering up because I'm interested in this race. Creator, maybe? I don't remember. Okay, if we expand that out to also the runners, thank you again, Todd, the runners that were in second, <laughs> we see that that same energy expenditure, you know, 50, a little below 50, now again, in the blue here are the place horses, and almost to a one, again, excluding 2013, it's a very late uh, profile for a mile and a half. To put it in perspective, nine out of the nine Belmont winners, in other words, the ones that will run at 10 furlongs, which is the Belmont stakes, were within 3.7 lengths of the second call. Five of the last nine were on or very close within a length, a length in 1.1, I think, one of, was one of them. Um, very close to the lead of the second call. And eight of the nine Belmont winners had energy percentages between 49.9 and 50.8. That's very late. So what we're looking for from a, an historical perspective, this race favors a runner near the lead, uh, near or on the lead, but yet expends its uh, energy late. So that's historical. That's what the track would mm, seemingly prefer. What does the race require? What is, in other words, what is the projected pace of the race in the 2022 Belmont? Well, it projects Skippy Long stocking on top of the big lead at the first and second call. And as a result, puts the race up as unpressured. My memory perhaps is not as good as it was uh, when I was a student. But I do remember in the Preakness, Skippy Longstocking uh, also projected to have an early lead. And I remember in that video, you can go back and watch it, I warned that this projection used very fast fractions from Gulfstream Mile internals. Now, you might say, well, shouldn't the software have seen that? Well, not all the time. It's like if, if you're a, a speed handicapper and you use speed numbers, whether you use uh, speed ratings, buyer numbers, uh, sheets numbers, and like that, often you'll see a horse, okay, 89, 88, 87, 103, 82. So one of two things. One, the horse woke up and ran like a champion one day, or something was going on with that number. And that was my sense about Skippy Longstocking, which, as you know, did, didn't run very well. Um, well. Well, it certainly didn't get the lead uh, as it projected to, a, a long early lead in the Preakness a few weeks ago. So if we take Skippy Longstocking out of the equation, we find, to no one's surprise, we the people, at or near the lead in the first and second calls with Golden Glider because fractions in the Peter Pan were pretty swift. Interestingly, instead of being an unpressured race, the race is now kind of normal. Handful of horses at or near the lead, handful of closers. And when I showed you the blank canvas, the beginning of the analysis with Value Capper, Value Capper had the race uh, biased early. If we say, okay, Skippy Longstocking may not run uh, to those fractions, what if we say it's a normal distribution and we bias it neutral? <sighs> we the people in Modonigal is still up there. Nest, it kind of improves a little bit. Golden Glider um, shifts to below random, not surprisingly. Again, we're stuck with these prices. In other words, I'm not seeing, right now, I'm not seeing a horse I really like that the public really shouldn't. But we'll soldier on. Again, from the early bias 
morning line favorites right on top. Let's look further. And again, why am I looking for f further? Because otherwise this would be a 30 second video. Hey guys, it's a mile and a half. <laughs> what am I gonna do with pace on this? Uh, don't see, I got the morning line favorites on top, past the race. Bye, have a, have a great Belmont Stakes. And look, a little bit of a confession. I'm a racing fan as well as a, you know, so-called expert, whatever the hell that means. You know, people look, Michael, what's your opinion? Oh, I don't really have an opinion. But I'm expected to do this, so I do it. And in doing so, by the way, when I'm at the race book and I'm looking at a race at Presque Isle Downs or a claimer at uh, Parks or something, do I do all of this analysis? No. This is to show you the tools and the stuff that can be done. In some races I do, I take apart. Here I'm looking for, I'm pretty sure there's no prime value bet here. I'm looking for a recreational play. Why? It's a big day and I'm a racing fan and I allow myself that on big days. So with that in mind, let's look at the runners one at a time, looking at their second call position and energy expenditure to see if we can make some more nuanced distinctions. But remember, for a horse to do well, it's got to have good numbers. Oh, really? God, what a genius. Let me write that down. Could you repeat that, Michael? Yes. For a horse to do well, it's, <laughs> it's got to be fast in its field. It's got to have good numbers. In order for that position and its percentage energy to matter. If you're betting a slow horse, in a race that's full of pressure because it's going to close, well, does it really matter if it closes from 10th to 6th in the stretch? Okay, you get it? So it, we need both of those things. Let's look at the top of the value capital line, We the People, the morning line favorite. Positionally, well, this runner has only had four races, been on or very close to the lead in three of them. Uh, the only one that... Uh, he didn't, was the Arkansas Derby, uh, his one loss. The numbers are fine. In fact, it's the target in the race, long story, but basically the best number out of the last race, best of my, my number, the master pace number. Um, the percentage early is a little bit early. Um, the only one that was right on was it, its win at Oaklawn, its allowance race at Oaklawn, where it it hit a 49.68. The other numbers are 51, 53, 51.8. That's a little early. Okay, let's keep that in mind. Does that mean disqualify the horse? No. I mean, if I'm throwing stones, let's see. One it's maiden, one non-winner's one, goes into grade one. I don't know what happened in the Arkansas Derby. Comes into the Peter Pan, blows the field away. Ah, kind of tricky. So we can only go by hints. I mean, uh, champion-looking horse, uh, Colt, three out of four lifetime, one for one at Belmont, maybe a little early. I'm being picky here because I'm kind of sort of leaning into looking for a reason where we the people may not win, and that's n not a habit I like. But I'm doing it because it's a big race and, you know, can Pozzola pick a long shot that actually runs? Well, we'll see. Modonigal, on the other hand, has the opposite issue. Um, the numbers are, are okay. It, it ran a 153.3 and breaking its maiden to 150.6 in the wood. Uh, the energy expenditure is fine. It's where we want it in the 50s and uh, even the 49s. It may be positionally a little too late. This, to no one's surprise, the cult likes to close. Now, you may say, well, aren't we finished at this point? Aren't we finished to say that um, uh, we the people running early and then Mo Donegal closing late into it? I'll just take an exacto with those two. They're at the top of your line. They're the fastest horses. And yeah, on one level, sure. Problem is, there's no no price there. And in my mind, there's just too much randomness in the game. A horse not feeling well, a horse stumbling at the start, a horse throwing the jockey, and so forth, uh, to 
justify betting low price horses. So, continuing, Nest. Now, Nest has strong numbers. When she won the Ashland, she, she ran a 153.9. When she won the Suncoast, she ran a 154.2. Um, back last year at Belmont, she ran a 154 and a 152. Those are really good numbers in this field. Also, look at her uh, energy percentages exactly spot on, bang on, 50.3, 49.3, 50.47. How about positionally? Where does this filly run? Reading from the top down, four by one and a half, three by a half, two by a head, four by two, three by three, two by a half, forwardly placed near the, near the pace. Is this filly? And there's the rub. Can she run against the Colts? Don't know. Are her numbers good? Yeah, they're excellent. Is she in the right position? Based on her past performances, yes. Does she expend her energy early? Yep. Got to look at it. Personally, I think Ness might get bet. Um, but we move on. I mean, of, of all of the contenders, I think Nest has the um, running style, energy expenditure, and numbers that are most suited to Belmont's track profile at a mile and a half. Here's an interesting cold golden glider who finished 10 lengths behind We the People in the Peter Pan. Um, the numbers are just okay. Number run in the Peter Pan wasn't so great. The number run in the Bluegrass, pretty good, right on the target today. The number um, when he won at Tampa, 155. Uh, they're okay. Position? Uh, this cult has been forwardly placed, it's been back in the field, and its percentage er, uh, early being kind of mixed kind of justifies this. So I don't know what to do really with this. It doesn't tell me anything. It doesn't mean because you have some parameters, every horse you can make a clear decision. That's one where I can't. Skippy Longstocking, uh, this colt will beat me if, if he wires the field. I find that her number, uh, uh, his, G's. This runner's numbers are weak. One thirty-nine seven on top. Of all the other numbers never run the target. Um, it's percentage early, a little early. So I'm pretty much done. And that Skippy Longstocking moving like a winner. Uh, okay, happens. I don't know, maybe the horse didn't feel well last time. It feels great this time. Here we go. Rich Strike, another colt that'll beat me if it wins the Belmont. Um, first of all, as we saw, Belmont, the Belmont Stakes is not conducive to deep closers. And Rich Strike is a deep closer. Um, his numbers are not great. Uh, he's another one who's never met the target of 150. 151.7, almost 152. Now, you may say, and this would be <laughs> perfectly legitimate, yeah, Michael, um, just a little heads up for you. What's that? Um, you said the same thing about him in the Derby. You had him nowhere on the line, and he wound up winning at 80 to 1. Yeah, these things happen. The Colts that um, value cap are favored, and everyone else did. Epicenter and Zandon ran second and third behind a rank outsider. Um, just because I take a value-oriented approach, does that mean I'm going to find every long price horse? Now, is there a way to get rich strike in the Derby? Enough clicking around, enough looking at, looking at the race this way and that way, and you can come up with some theory that might potentially get that colt, and then keep pushing that rock up the hill, apply that to the next race, and it doesn't work, and then apply something that gets the last two and push that up. You get it. Barber Road, uh, I like this colt from way back in the early prep races, and 
he hasn't done that much. He's got some nice seconds, you know, was second in the Arkansas, ran a decent race in the Derby, um, a very good race, in my opinion, in the Rebel, and so forth. Uh, its numbers are fine. And here's another one that's mixed as far as how he expends his energy. Um, I would look at this as a potential one to use in exotics. And finally, creative minister. This is going to take a little work. Stay with me. His numbers are good, uh, or at least in the allowance that he won at Churchill and the, ma and the maiden race at Gulfstream, 152-153. The percentage early in the last couple of races are fine. You may ask, why is this colt at the very bottom of the value cap line? And the key is that little green line, value capper goes through and quote unquote opens uh, a horse's form cycle window to see how deep it's going to go to look for back numbers. Long story, years of my life developing those uh, algorithms. So value capper just use its Preakness line. That's why it's at the very bottom. Very, very, not just the bottom of the horses above random, very bottom of all eight of these runners. Now, if we were to say, okay, look, I'm going to use Creative Minister, I'm going to use all of his races, then with that form cycle wide open, Creative Minister comes up third on the line, tied with Nest. So, okay. What do we do with all of this? Well, first of all, and maybe overriding, the Belmont is running at a mile and a half. This is not a distance that's optimal for pace analysis. Well, I ascribe to the, in fact, was, I think helpful in developing this, that once you get past nine and a half furlongs, those internal fractions are just not as, as helpful. Secondly, value capper's assessment basically agrees with the public, right? Because uh, we, the people, Modonical are on top. We've got Ness, who, you know, may or may not be bad. Um, Golden Glider, you know, who knows? As a prime bet for me, no go. And those two reasons, the distance of the race and just looking at it from a very consistent point of view, which I do because I use the same software every day, I'm kind of agreeing with the public. If I'm digging in and looking for a recreational secondary bet, here's what I do. I'll take the position, and normally I wouldn't do this, but yeah, if I squint, I, I could say that we the people might be too early to win this race. And what happened in the only grade one race it won, in the, uh, it, it ran in, excuse me, because Peter Pan is a grade three, the, the only grade one in which it ran, it ran terribly, maybe it's too early. Okay, I'll take that position. Because I'm, you know, look, I'm a racing fan, I'm looking for something, right? Not your bread and butter claiming races in the middle of the week where, where you can find good legitimate overlays. I'll take the position, Mo Donegal's too late, too late to win, could get into the exotics, of course. I'll have an exacta and try box. I'll use creative minister because I was creative with that call, right? I'm saying, nah, um, he's the fulcrum in the race. If you want to know what the fulcrum is, I did a video called Stop Betting Slow Horses. Uh, I won't get into it here. Uh, Nest, she is uh, spot on as, as in terms of position and expenditure of energy. I may throw golden glitter in um, only because if We the People doesn't run, Mm, this horse may have a shot. Uh, I, I need very long prices. Looking for supers, I uh, would put in Barber Road with the decent numbers and the expenditure. Um, but but honestly, it's it's not a prime bet. I can't tell you uh, one of these just jump off the page because they don't. Because as I said, morning line favorites are prominent in the value capper line. Now, if any of those go off at over 12 to 1, I don't think I'll get 12 to 1 on Nest. 
Golden Glider, yeah, I'll have a secondary bet on it, you know. Uh, so a small secondary bet. And that would be my strategy. Now, I'm sorry for those of you who want quick, you know, five-minute videos. Here's what it is. I like this. I don't like this. Uh, I, I don't do that. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do that because this conclusion is a nuanced one coming out of not only a contrarian approach or value capping, but how that contrarian approach inter intersects with conventional things like good numbers and good form cycle analysis. So thank you so much for spending this time with me to uh, really go in-depth uh, on the Belmont Stakes. And mm, the kids put a post-it note on my monitor. Please ask those who are watching to subscribe and like the video. If you like this video, please consider liking it and subscribing. Never did this before. Um, not that I'm new to YouTube. I just looked. My first YouTube video was 12 years ago. But I, I don't do it for really for commercial purposes. So I'm not a YouTuber like the kids are and so forth. But if you do that, that would be great. Most of all, thank you for spending this time with me. Uh, thank you for your interest in the game this great and fantastic game. Those of you who are, uh, who have the Value Capper software, who have the Black Magic software, who are on the Wizards Forum, can't thank you enough for your support of, of our work and of each other. Uh, those of you who are um, interested in uh, really understanding what goes into making a value play and are not disappointed to find out that on this day, on this race, uh, at this time, there is no value play. In other words, uh, some people say, well, you're supposed to be an expert. You're supposed to be able to pick a race. Uh, who says? We get to pass races. And I know that's not a popular uh, message, but it's a key to success at this great game. Best of luck, not only at the Belmont, but always. And once again, thank you so much. Remember to wait for your prices and let the bet make you. I'll see you soon.